if you're going to treat massive data sets, and really massive, a lot of, we're talking a lot about high dimensions, but uh, the word massive data has not really kind of come up directly as much as you might hope it would. And so this topic, screening uh, and the broad vision of it is going to be uh, very important to be talking about. Happy to have here. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about this topic of streaming. I was originally given the title streaming. I kind of stretched it a little bit because I think this topic has sort of developed over the past 15, 20 years with a lot of activity. Um, and, and this word streaming, it sort of originally came about with the idea that um, you're going to process a large amount of data and you know, it's going to be so massive you can't really even think about looking at all of it at once. What if you can only look at a piece of it at a time? So in particular, if we think of this data as sort of being formed from lots of little pieces that sort of tell us about some small thing that's going on so that the overall data set is sort of the aggregation of all these small pieces, what can we do if we just sort of look at things one piece at a time and put them together? But actually, um, the techniques that I'm going to talk about are slightly more general than that. So I'm, I'm going to try and sort of emphasize that these don't just apply in this sort of read once setting, but they apply in a slightly more general case, um, which will help us get more of a handle on scaling computations up to um, very large data set sizes. So um, I'm in the fortunate position that, uh, like most of the other speakers, I don't really need to give any motivation for this at all. Uh, Michael's opening talk on Tuesday basically laid the groundwork and gave us all the motivation we need for thinking about problems over large data. Um, so let me sort of try and, and boil down to the essence of, of, of what's sort of the idea at the heart of this area. Um, the idea is, is, is really quite simple. It says, well, if you've got a very large amount of information, a very large amount of data, that's really too big to work with conveniently, it doesn't fit on your computers, you know, it's too big to even sort of read in, in all together, then let's just make it smaller and work with a smaller representation of the data. So the real question at the heart of this area is to say, well, how can we make our data sets small enough to be convenient to manipulate, small enough to be able to sort of fit on a, on a single machine, even on a single laptop? So what we're really looking for are ways to summarize large amounts of data in such a way that we can argue that this summary is going to be effective, is going to capture whatever features, whatever attributes of, of the data that we're interested in with sufficient accuracy. Um, up to the fact that we're going to hit some obvious limitations, there are going to be some, some things where, where there is going to be no summary. But in general, we, you know, for a lot of problems, there are a lot of positive results that say we can build these kind of summaries. Um, and, and so we're going to think about, well, when can we construct them and what are some of the techniques we can use to build these summaries? What kind of guarantees will they give us for working with this kind of data? So firstly, you know, what, how do we formalize a summary? I'm going to shy away from giving a precise mathematical definition of a summary on the grounds that, in most cases, we'll know it when we see it. Um, but you know, at a more sort of um, high-level view, well, a summary should be something that's fairly small, uh, ideally something that we'll be able to keep in, in file storage in a, in a computer. And for it to be at all useful, we have to be able to get to that summary. So we have to be able to build that summary fairly effectively. Uh, we have to be able to update it as we see more information arriving. Um, and we have to interact with that summary to get information out. So, you know, thinking sort of computationally, almost thinking about how would I start to program one of these, well, I need to start thinking about how would I create an empty summary. And for most cases, that's going to be fairly straightforward because the empty summary is going to be the empty set. How do I update that summary as I see maybe one new piece of information? And if I sort of incrementally keep updating my summary with each successive piece of information, that captures this, this notion of streaming computation that I alluded to at the start. But more generally, I'd also like to say, well, if, if I've made a summary of my data, and you've made a summary of your data using the same process and maybe even using some similar parameters, then there ought to be a way that we can merge those two summaries together to obtain a, a summary of, of the union or the aggregation of those two collections of data. And if we can additionally have this sort of merging property, then this gives us something stronger. It lets us start thinking about distributing the computation over multiple machines, over partitions of the data set. And, and again, you're talking about 
how do we start thinking of, of scaling all the techniques we've heard about so far to you know, truly massive amounts of data distribution, splitting the computation over multiple machines, letting us run you know, tens, hundreds, or thousands of machines in parallel is really going to be key to that. So anything that allows us to do distribution uh, and also makes our lives easy enough that we don't have to worry too much about fine-grained synchronization and coordination across the machines is, is going to help us work towards that goal. And lastly, you know, obviously to get any value out of this summary, I've actually got to be able to interact with it, I've got to be able to interrogate it. So I have to go to this summary and, and sort of answer some notion of a query. And what that query is is going to be dependent on the kind of problem that I'm thinking about, the kind of summary that I've built. So, so rather, in a rather cavalier fashion, I sort of threw in this term sufficient statistics to say that, that you know, we, we're used to the idea of sufficient statistics um, of, of being, you know, what, what's the information that we need to keep to capture um, you know, crucial information about distribution? Well, in some ways, the, you can think of this as a generalization of that notion. It's trying to say, what are the sufficient statistics for a broad range of different computations? Um, can we keep them in such a way that it's, um, we can update those sufficient statistics as we see more draws from our distribution? The other thing I want to sort of bring into this, um, you know, I, I, I was really excited about this idea of, of sort of the boot camp and bringing together people from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, and I sort of said, well, well, bear in mind that you're going to be addressing not just people from your own little niche of computer science, but people more from mathematical backgrounds, from statistical backgrounds, machine learning, and other areas. So I, I don't necessarily know the best way to address that wide an audience, but at least what I can do is maybe try and expose some of the, the axioms and assumptions that I realize are sort of inherent in the style of, of working that, that I, I follow and that others around me follow. So I try to say, well, what characterizes sort of the computer science approach to dealing with, with these kind of questions? Um, and so the first thing I came up with is I said, well, we're very cynical. Um, we're, we're concerned with the price of everything. Um, actually, this is something that, again, Michael mentioned um, in his characterization of, of computation in, in perhaps slightly more favorable terms on Tuesday, which is that computation, the study of computation is primarily study of the use of, of certain resources. Right. So in particular, when we're thinking about building these summaries, what we're interested in are the resource of space, the size of this summary, the, the you know, number of, of pieces of information we need to describe this summary. Um, we're also interested in, in this notion of, of time as a resource. As we process more information, how much time does that take to process each update? Or when we, when we pose one of these queries to the summary, how much time does that take? Th these concepts are going to be interrelated with some notion of, of how accurate an answer do we get. We're not going to expect you know, a perfect answer because we're giving away um, expressiveness because we're coming up with this compact representation then necessarily we're going to be um, coming up with some approximation. And we want to bring in some characterization of that approximation into the space and the time required for processing this. The other thing that I think is, is maybe um, not something that we necessarily think of first, but actually comes into this particular notion of computation is another resource that, that we treat as, as being somewhat limited is randomness. I'll explain exactly what I mean by that in a moment, but basically um, many of the technique, pretty much every technique I'll talk about involves using randomization, tossing some random coins. Um, and often what we need is we need to um, return to those random coins later, right? I, I toss some coins based on seeing a certain piece of information, and later I want to retrieve the value of those coins. So effectively the amount of randomness that my procedure uses uses plays into this notion of the space required. Um, so we actually have to start thinking about randomness as another resource to worry about. Um, what else? Okay, so we're cynical, we're also pessimistic. Um, what does that mean? It means I'm not going to make any, any charitable assumptions about what I'm presented with. I'm, I'm not going to actually make any strong assumptions about the, the distribution of the input. Right. In fact, you know, this, this is, I think this is quite a non-statistical way of looking at it. You know, when, when, when Michael's talking about, you know, are you a frequentist or a Bayesian, this is sort of a, an additional category which is none of the above. You know, we don't really believe, uh, we don't really sort of assume randomness 
um, in the input data. We just say the input data is fixed. But we also don't assume a prior on sort of the parameter space we're looking at. Often what we're saying is we want to do a certain kind of computation which has a particular answer on the fixed data. Um, and you know, the whole randomization, the randomness in the process that we use is something that actually we bring in to the computation. We design algorithms that toss coins uh, and bring in randomness that way. Um, so, and and may, in many cases, you know, I think this is debatable. We, we can get into longer discussions offline about how maybe we should be making more, you know, allowing ourselves more assumptions about the input distribution. But essentially, this, this is a, uh, you know, this, this, this means that the pessimist is never disappointed. We don't make any assumptions about the input, so the results that we get hold, you know, whatever the input distribution is. Um, so things can only get better if we can start making assumptions about input distributions. Um, I'm going to borrow a phrase from uh, Les Valiant, uh, probably approximately correct. The kind of, the way we want to state our results are, are in this sort of probably approximately correct framework. That is, we want to say, well, you know, there's some notion of, of the true answer, and we're within some epsilon confidence interval around that with probability at least 1 minus delta. And what that means is that the tools we use are the ones we've been hearing about all week, ones around concentration of measure. I'm actually going to mostly use just the, the very basic ones, Markov, Chebyshev, and Chernoff bounds. Um, in principle, you know, we can go on and use uh, stronger, stronger uh, concentration results as well. Um, and, and just sort of expanding on that point I was making earlier, um, yeah, randomness is a limited resource. We often want to think of our randomness as, as being you know, truly random, but also in some sense a function of, of some index i, so that when I see i again, I can retrieve those bits of randomness. So either that means I must explicitly store random bits, or actually the trick that we'll be using a lot of is, is to say, well, I'm not actually going to explicitly store that randomness. I'm going to sort of think of using a, a, a hash function, a function that appears random, but it, and is a, function, is a function of a much smaller number of random bits, so that I can apply that hash function to i and retrieve um, the same randomness as a function of i, but still analyze this process and argue that, you know, that this gives us the, the guarantees that we want. Um, so often I'll be trying to reason about what kind of randomness we need, what, what strength of independence of randomness we need. Um, and in a few cases, we do sort of shrug and say, actually, it's easy to analyze if we just assume full independence and sort of push the issue of exactly how that's materialized in small space um, to one side. Um, certainly in this presentation, I'm not going to be too concerned about constant factors. So we're going to be in the realms of, of big O notation. Um, and, and sort of forgetting about those. And again, as, as these sort of techniques transition close to practice, people do start caring more about constant factors. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of examples along the way about where people are using these techniques and where they're trying to actually um, not just look at, at the costs in big O notation, but really squeeze out what those leading constants are. Um, so let's, let's think now about how I should, how I'm going to interact with the data. So as, as I've alluded to, we, we're often going to think of this, this massive quantity of data as being represented as a collection of fairly simple tuples. Um, and you know, the problems I'm going to phrase uh, initially are actually relatively uh, simple to state. The reason that we're going to, th going to treat them as hard and need all this machinery to work with them is because we have to scale things up, uh, deal with the dimensionality of the input. Uh, and, and do, the, do simple computations on large amounts of data uh, in a, in a non-trivial way. Um, so I'm, I'm going to sort of ca give two models um, that sort of capture this notion. That's going to be general enough to, to give us quite a, a lot of different um, problems to think about. So the, the simplest model is this arrivals-only model that says um, we can think of the data as just sort of arriving incrementally. This is sort of a weighted arrival model. So here, this, this sort of partial input says, I see you know, three arrivals of x, two arrivals of, of a type y, two more arrivals of x. So in aggregate, you know, I have five, a weight of five associated with um, item x, a weight of two associated with, with item y. You know, that captures 
pretty much you know quite a lot of situations you can think of. A lot of the techniques I'm talking about were originally motivated in the context of understanding traffic on the internet. So you can think of this as sort of representing packets on a network, and you're tracking you know uh, which are the most popular destinations. Um, the second model um, generalizes this slightly and just says, well, as read as well as as positive weight updates, I can also tolerate uh, negative weight updates. So you know, I see some arrivals for X, I see some arrivals for Y, but maybe I also see some departures for X. Um, and it, it turns out that in some cases, um, dealing with the model where we only have to deal with arrivals with increments can be easier, can, can give us sort of slightly stronger results than the model where we, we, more general model where we can also tolerate sort of departures or decrements. So, so that's sort of the setup for, um, for today. So today's outline, uh, I'm going to be covering mostly problems concerned with sort of extracting functions from vectors. Um, so we're thinking of the, that stream or that collection of inputs as defining um, one very large high dimensional vector and we're going to start pulling out information about that vector. Um, so I'm going to talk about sort of frequency distributions and, and just, just very quickly introduce the concentration bounds we're going to make use of. Start talking about some of the sketches for pulling out, say, the most significant uh, peaks in these frequency distributions. Talk about uh, essentially a, a result that parallels or, or almost um, equals the uh, johnson linda strauss dimensionality reductions we've already heard about. Talk about you know, another basic computation, which is just saying, well, what's the L0 norm? What's the number of non-zero entries? in this vector, effectively what's the number of distinct elements that I've seen in my stream. Uh, and if time at the end, talk about some of the more complex uh, computations um, that people have looked at. Um, going on to sort of a preview of, of what we'll get to tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to sort of pick out a few uh, advanced topics on, uh, in this realm. So we're going to look at sort of sampling techniques and particularly some of the recent work around, around uh, what's called LP sampling and how that applies to graph uh, and frequency moment computations. Um, we'll look at some matrix computations so that will echo uh, a lot of the things we heard from Michael uh, and Petros already. Um, and I'll also try and talk a little bit about lower bounds. Um, what are the limitations of what we can achieve here? What are, you know, can we actually show bounds that say, if you want a summary for this particular problem, it needs, with this kind of accuracy, it needs to be at least this big. Um, and that there's no way of, of getting a smaller summary. Okay. What we'll start with now is, is this notion of, of frequency distributions. And the reason is, you know, it's very natural, it's very easy to reason about. And it turns out that a lot of the, the core techniques from streaming and sketching uh, apply to this question, question surrounding um, frequency distributions. So, very basic, you know, I, I showed you those two models where you have um, some collection of items and information about arrivals and departures of those items. So, at any instant, you can say, well, let fi be the number of occurrences of item i. Then you can start saying, well, just on those fi's alone, I can ask lots of meaningful questions, right? I can say, can you retrieve uh, information about those, those indexes i? that have large associated frequencies. Uh, can we find the number of um, FIs that are non-zero, effectively the number of, of distinct elements that we've seen? This notion of, of frequency moments is absolutely core to the work on streaming. It, it sort of started this, this whole line of work back in 96. It sort of gave the current emphasis behind it because um, the, these turn out to, to sort of um, impact lots of other questions down the line, but, but equally, you know, just on their own are interesting. So we want to know um, these, these sort of tantalizingly simple looking calculations. Can we just compute um, the kth power of the frequencies summed up? So in particular, um, F, F1 is just the, the sum. That's going to be trivial. F2 we can think of equivalently as being the squared Euclidean norm. So this is going to be very tightly connected back to Johnson and Strauss. 
um, and higher moments uh, have their own interpretations. Okay, hopefully this is, this is going to be completely uh, familiar to everyone. We're going to make a lot of use of concentration bounds um, because we're going to follow a particular pattern uh, um, in a lot of cases. For a lot of problems, we're going to think about uh, building an appropriate uh, estimator for some quantity of interest. Um, and we want to give confidence bounds on that estimate, so we're going to you know, think of our estimator as a random variable and, and use concentration bounds around that so that we can end up with some statement like this that says that probability that our estimate is close to um, our, our target answer within some epsilon times some, some other quantity y. Um, prob probability that we're far from our target is going to be at most delta. Okay. So what's the starting point for um, concentration bounds? The starting point is the Markov inequality. Um, again, I think we should all be pretty familiar with this. That what we're going to be able to say is at the end is just that the probability that a random variable exceeds uh, some constant k is bounded by the expectation that a random variable over k. I just find it very refreshing and, and grounding to realize that you can you know, prove this statement on a single slide. So there's, there's not really any magic here. It's just a, a matter of um, relating uh, any, any uh, non-negative random variable um, to the probability of exceeding that, that value k. Um, so it, you know, this, this, turn, this is in some sense relatively weak. It doesn't say something very strong. But actually, even in this form, it it's turns out to be useful. Uh, and obviously, it's going to be the starting point for uh, many of the other concentration bounds we'll make use of. Okay. So I, 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 in the title, I use this word sketch. Um, and, and you know, the idea of sketch is sort of evocative of, of just you know, sketching a drawing. We're going to think about how do we sketch um, a, this large amount of information. Um, so in particular, I want to think about a, a way of building a summary where I can think of it as a linear transformation of the input. In other words, my, my sketch, my summary that I'm going to build of, of my input x, I'm going to be able to think of it as just some, some sketch matrix S multiplying x. And why is that convenient? Well, it's, it's convenient because you know, it, it immediately gives us this nice linearity property that uh, if I have two inputs, x and y, then I can build a sketch of any linear combination of x and y just by taking linear combinations of their sketches. What that means in the framework that I said at the start is that if I want to think about updating um, my summary, if I want to think about adding one new piece of information, then that's, that's kind of trivial in this setting because I just have to look at the sketch matrix applied to that one new piece of information and then add that onto my running sketch. And if I want to merge two sketches, I just sort of add them up entry-wise. Um, however, I'm not going to really adopt this, this sketch matrix um, representation. I'm going to actually describe most of these sketches in terms of hash functions. Um, and the reason for, for adopting this is just that if these hash functions are are simple, then this sketch is going to be very fast to operate, and it's going to have a very compact representation. All right, I don't really want to think about actually materializing this sketch matrix S, because that's going to be larger than the data that I'm working with. So I'm always going to be looking for an implicit representation of this kind of sketch matrix. And, and as I talked about before, we're going to deal with, with um, randomness. Um, I'm going to think about these hash functions as as being um, sort of limited independence. What that means is that um, if I say a hash function is k-wise independent, um, then if I look at the, the sort of the hash values of up to k different indices, um, then the probability of, of how those are mapped to values looks approximately uniform. Right? And the nice thing about this is, is you know, over over the last decades, we've built quite a strong theory around this kind of k-wise independent hash function. So in particular, we know for small values of k, we're in a very good place. We can get this kind of k-wise independence um, with a hash function that requires just space k to represent the, the randomly chosen parameters of that hash function. OK. So, so here's a, a first sketch, uh, just to sort of warm us up, and then, then we'll get into the more complex sketches. 
Um, so suppose I want to test if, if two binary vectors are equal. Right? So I want to sort of say, uh, look, at, look at these two vectors, say are they equal or are they not equal. Right? So if I've got them both in front of me and I can kind of run through them, that's fairly straightforward. But can I build a sketch that lets me um, do this? Can I build some compact representation of each vector so that I can very quickly test if they're equal or not? So this is, this is something that computer scientists will probably be quite familiar with. Um, what we want to do is exactly sort of materialize the right kind of hash function to apply to these vectors um, and store just the hash function of the vectors um, and argue that the, if these two hash functions give us the same value on x and y, then there's a very small chance that x and y differ. However x and y are chosen, um, with the assumption that you know, they're chosen without knowledge of the randomness used to, to create the, uh, the hash function. So how should we choose this, this hash function that's going to let us test this equality? Um, what we're going to do is, is um, choose a hash function of this form. Um, we're going to think of the hash function of this vector x as being the sum over indexes i of the ith entry of x times r raised to the power i uh, over the prime field p, where r is, is our randomness, r is chosen in the range 1 up to p minus 1. So, you know, why is, why is this, firstly, why is this a sketch? It's a sketch because if we look at it, what we're doing is we're just computing a linear transform of x, i, of x right? All the x, i's appear just as um, linear, uh, linear scale, scaled by linear quantity. Um, and add it up. Um, why does this work? It's, it's a relatively straightforward exercise. Basically, it comes down to the fact that we're evaluating a polynomial um, at a randomly chosen location, uh, and then we can just argue that the chance that um, two different polynomials evaluate to zero um, is proportional to the degree of those polynomials. Um, and that, if so, if we choose um, the size of the field over which we do the computation large enough, then the probability of, of finding a hash collision in this way is going to be small enough that everything's going to work. So, okay, so that says that actually for this very basic question of just saying, is this one massive data set equal to this other massive data set, um, that's something we can build a sketch that meets our requirements um, very effectively. But in general, we want to do something a little bit more than just testing equality. Um, sure. So I just want to be clear here. Yeah. N is now the dimensionality of the vector. Yes. Vector. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I am probably going to switch notation around that a few times, but I'm going to try and notionally we should try and stick to thinking of N as the dimensionality. Okay, so um, let's, let's look at a, a, a slightly more complicated sketch. Um, so here's a sketch that's going to help us pull out information about significant entries in these large vectors. So again, think, think of our um, uh, input data as representing a vector. Uh, and here you'll notice I've just switched from n to u. Um, and what we're going to do is, is, again, think of doing this through this sketching procedure. Um, but again, I'm going to express it in terms of, of hash functions and, and operations on single items at a time. So although, I can, although normally I might think of this sketch transform as giving me a, a, a sort of a compact vector as my summary, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to reconfigure that vector as an array of w times d. It's going to be much more convenient to think about it that way. Um, I'm going to equip myself with d hash functions to uh, map the vector entries uh, from 1 up to w. So I'm going to sort of hash entries from, from my input vector u onto entries in w, and each I'm going to repeat that d times um, um, once for each of these rows. So what, what, how does that look? If I think about where a single index j with, with weight c goes to, 
Then in this sketch, I think about the first hash function mapping j to some entry in the first row, the second hash function mapping j to some entry in the second row, the third, uh, fourth, and so on. So each entry in the vector is mapped to one bucket in every row. Um, and what we do in, in that uh, uh, bucket there is we're just going to add up the contribution for everything that maps into that location. Okay, so that, that has that nice linearity property. Uh, it means that we can think about merging by summation in the standard way. And then we can think about how do we estimate, go back and estimate the, the weight of an entry of a particular uh, entry in the vector. What we'll do is we'll go to everywhere that that entry has been mapped in the sketch. Look at each of those. Each of those contains a contribution from that element along with um, the contribution of all the other elements that collided with it under these hash functions. So we're definitely going to get some noise. But um, on the assumption that this vector has uh, non-negative weights in it, then if we take sort of the smallest of those places, the smallest weight associated with the places where that element falls, then that should give us, um, in some sense, the best estimate. Uh, for that um, for that original element. And in fact, what we can do is we can argue that the error that this sketch gives us is actually quite small. Uh, what we can do is argue um, that in terms of what we call F1, which is just, again, the sum of all the weights, we're getting error at most epsilon if we pick our parameter W large enough, if we pick parameter W that proportional to 1 over epsilon. Why is that? It actually turns out to be um, fairly straightforward uh, analysis. Um, essentially, the way the argument goes is just to say, well, look at the expectation of the error associated with um, each entry in a particular row. So I'm, I'm looking for element uh, j. I look in the first row. I have, in the bucket where that is placed, I have the contribution from that element plus the noise from elements colliding with it and an expectation that's just a uniform um, fraction of the mass of all other elements. Um, so in particular with, if I look at what's the probability that that mass is more than twice its expectation, then just by immediately by Markov inequality, I know there's constant probability that I see more than, than twice the expected mass. So if I then take the minimum over all of those um, repetitions, then the probability that the minimum of those exceeds um, twice the expectation of, of the mass um, is, is diminished um, down to, you know, um, exponentially. Sorry, question. Um, so what's happening is I've taken my whole vector, I've taken each entry of the vector, hashed it to some entry in each row, and added up just the weight associated with each entry. So you can think of each bucket as being the summation of the weights of all elements that hash into that location. How do you hash it? How do you hash it? You take your hash function and you apply it. So, so in particular, I guess the qu one, one, one question is, what is the nature of the hash function? So in this case, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so this is a, a randomly chosen hash function drawn from a family of pairwise independent hash functions. So essentially, this this is a hash function that is just fairly uniformly spreading out the entries. So I'm looking at the family of hash functions that you define. Yes. And I'm taking a hash function uniformly at random from that class. Yes. Which point in the argument does this appear? Um, so what, what all we rely on is the probability of a collision uh, we can treat uniformly and we can look at what's the expected um, mass colliding with any entry um, in any bucket in the sketch. Uh, and that is, a, in some sense, that's a very weak condition on the hash function. It just needs to, because we're looking at expectation, we're going to use linearity of expectation. So all we need is that each pair of elements 
are mapped approximately uniformly independent. Right. Okay. So when you put that all together, what it actually gives you is, is the ability to recover information about this vector. So, so in particular, this, this gives us a biased estimator. Uh, and what it says is that our estimate, uh, in this case, always exceeds the true weight. Um, and with fairly high probability, our estimate is at most epsilon times the total weight uh, more than the, uh, than the true answer. So what does that do? It, it lets you go back to that question I sort of outlined a while ago and says, how do we find the, the heavy hitters? How do we find the significant entries in the sketch? Um, so in fact, we can use, in, in the original vector, we can use the sketch to address that question. So one way of doing that is to um, simply sort of iterate over all possible indexes um, and test each one of them and see, do they pass this threshold? Are they sort of, is the estimated mass of this index heavy? Um, so obviously that's rather unsatisfying because uh, that's a very slow way of, of interrogating the structure, especially if this sketch is summarizing a vector of very high dimension. So the alternate approach is, is to start thinking about other ways of doing this. A simple first step is to say, let's, let's sort of notionally keep a binary tree over the input domain so that each node in that tree corresponds to uh, a subset of um, indices. Um, and, and so think of associating a weight with each node as, as being the aggregation of the sum of the weights of everything in its subtree. Um, and then you can sort of, then you can imagine sketching not just the, the vector at the raw level, but the vector at every level of aggregation. And then you can follow a fairly simple search procedure to find those large frequencies where we essentially start at the root, uh, expand out, probe the, the sketches at each subsequent level, discard any branches that correspond to sort of light estimates, uh, and descend until we uh, reach the leaves. So one, one comment to make here is that in, in some ways you can think of this as, as a first step towards uh, a compressed sensing style result. Um, what we have here is the ability to design a, a measurement regime, which we can apply to uh, a vector, um, that allows us to start going to that vector and sort of pulling out what are the significant entries. And those significant entries are effectively going to be the best thing to recover for our, our sparse recovery. So, so using fairly sort of simple technology, just simple hashing from a weak family of hash functions, a very sparse transformation. Um, and, and sort of interposing essentially a, a, um, a dyadic um, matrix in the middle to sort of uh, allow us to do the search efficiently. It, it gives us a, a result for you know, this, this celebrated problem of compressed sensing. So the results are somewhat weaker because in particular um, the guarantees that you obtain in terms of, of the probability of um, successfully recovering your sparse representation are not quite as strong, but actually there's a whole line of work coming from the computer science, science community that sort of starts with these kind of techniques and strengthens them to get essentially results that are competitive uh, with the current sort of best results for uh, compressed sensing. Uh, another sort of quick aside about this, um, this kind of technique has also been used a lot uh, in machine learning where in machine learning, you're, you're dealing with objects that have uh, potentially very, very large numbers of features. So think about um, uh, objects representing documents where the features might be all pairs of, of words that co-occur. This is a potentially huge feature space. So if you take sort of the standard approach and actually fully represent that very large feature space, um, then it's going to be very sort of slow and cumbersome to work with objects in this setting. So there's a line of work on this, this idea of hash kernels, where, where effectively what you do is, is you create a sketch. You, you apply this kind of hashing trick, hashing representation to your very large high dimensional feature vector to get you something much smaller that you can then sort of just plug in directly into your existing machine learning framework. And this turns out to be sort of surprisingly effective in practice. Um, and, and essentially, you know, the reason for that is, is just that 
the features that turn out to be important are preserved sort of sufficiently well that you can tolerate the noise that this kind of representation introduces for the, for the less important features. OK. So that's, that's the first sketch. Let's see how we can sort of take this a step further and, and do something uh, more complicated uh, with it. Um, so first, uh, you know, th that was a sketch that relied only on the Markov inequality. Let's give ourselves something slightly stronger to work with. Um, so Markov inequality itself directly is quite weak, but we can also apply it to, to any random variable. So in particular, we can apply it to um, the second moment. Uh, and when you sort of run Markov inequality over the second moment, what you get is the Chebyshev inequality um, that basically says the probability of x being far from a random variable x being far from its expectation um, decays as a function of the variance, so it should be variance of x. Um, uh, over the square of, of the distance. So we're going to, in particular, we're going to use it in this form. We're going to try and construct random variables that represent the estimation that our algorithm is giving us um, so that the variance is sufficiently small as a function of our target value, our target approximation epsilon, and the expectation um, of our, our random variable then that immediately gives us that the probability that we're more than epsilon um, time uh, far away from our expectation is a constant. So let's, let's put this into practice. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the AMS, or Elon Matar Segri sketch, um, which is going to allow us to estimate F2. That's the sum of the squares of the entries in this vector. And again, it turns out to be quite important because it's at the heart of, of quite a lot of streaming and non-streaming applications. Um, it it's gives us dimensionality reduction, and at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about how to interpret that. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take our existing sketch structure, count min sketch, and, and sort of extend it a little bit further by introducing a second set of hash functions. Um, so we have one set of hash functions that map us to entries in the sketch, we're now going to have a second set of hash functions which are going to map us to plus one, minus one values. So you know, using the, the terminology we've seen a lot of this week already, we can think of these as, as Radomacher variables. Um, the difference is, again, these are going to be hash functions. So instead of thinking of these as, as fully independent, these are actually going to be relatively low independence. Um, so how do we change things? So now, again, we when we, when we have a, a weight C associated with an entry J in the sketch, again, we're going to, to map that um, into the correct location in each row and add on the weight of that update multiplied by the hash value, the plus one, minus one hash value associated with, um, with uh, index J. Okay. So sort of similar picture as before. Index J maps in, um, but we, we're multiplying now by, uh, we're, multipl we're, we're summing up the weight associated with everything mapped to this entry, but multiplied by plus one, minus one. And then to, to pull out our estimation, um, we're going to do something a little bit different to what we've done before. Um, we're going to, for each row, we're going to square each entry in the sketch, sum those up. Uh, and then each of those is going to give us an estimator for um, F2. We're then going to take the median of each of those estimates. So why does this work? Um, relatively simple argument. Um, what we can do is sort of look at what do we get in each row. We get the sum over all entries in the sketch i of um, the ith entry in the sketch squared times the hash value squared. So we get sort of the squares of the um, individual entries. Um, but we also get a bunch of cross terms um, of elements that collide within the sketch. So what we get out, though, is because of the, the nature of these Radomacher variables, the squares, whether we got a minus one or a plus one, always goes to, when we square that, 
we always go to plus 1. So we get this contribution here of um, exactly the sum of the squared entries. And this, because of the, the, the um, independence of these two, we're going to treat these two as being uh, independent, then in expectation, these terms, plus 1, minus 1 products, go to 0. So the expectation of our estimator is exactly what we want, the sum of the squares. And what we have to do is argue about the, the variance of this estimator to argue that it gets small enough. So, so to repeat, the expectation of our row estimate is exactly the sum of the squares. Um, the variance is also an expectation. You can churn through this. Um, you, know, it, you, you go through a fair amount of algebra to simplify this. But essentially, what we're going to do is, is we're going to assume that this hash function is now four-wise independent, so it treats any collection of four terms fully independently. So that in expectation, anything with almost anything with four terms is going to be drop out to zero. There are only a couple of combinations of terms that we have to worry about, um, and we can bound those. So in particular, um, anything with an odd power of a hash of a of a g hash drops out to be zero in expectation. What it leaves us with is a few terms essentially where we have an even number uh, of i's and an even number of j's. Um, and we can bound that in terms of the square of the target that we're looking for, scaled by w, the number of, of buckets in this sketch. So what that gets is it gets us to the point where the row variance, the, the variance of the estimate coming from a single row, is bounded by the square of the thing that we're looking for, the square of, of f2 divided by w. So if we just set w large enough, we set w proportional to 1 over epsilon squared, and, and plug through that statement of the Chebyshev inequality we have already, then it says the probability of our estimator for rho k being more than epsilon squared times f2 away from f2 is at most a constant, is at most a quarter. So that gets us most of the way there. It says we have constant probability of being of a single estimate being close to the target. How do we drive that constant probability down to something much smaller, something more like um, delta? So one, one obvious first thing would be say, well, we got this down to a constant just by picking the size of the sketch w large enough. What if I just scale w up even further? Can I push this down? Well, it's not really an effective way to do it, because if we rescale w to make this whole probability more like delta, then we're going to be linear in 1 over delta. Um, and that's just too costly. What we're looking for really is a cost that goes more like logarithmic in 1 over delta. So what we can do is, is start using a, a stronger piece of uh, technology. We're going to use a churn-off bound. Um, and again, the way that we actually create the Chernoff bound is, is also by um, applying the Markov inequality. But in this time, we just apply the Markov inequality to a random variable that's equal to the, the ex exponentiated product of a bunch of random variables. And I don't need to go through this calculation, because actually that's something that Joel worked through more or less directly uh, in his second lecture uh, on Tuesday. So what we get is, is we get uh, a bound that says the probability that this random variable um, being a sum of independent Bernoulli trials um, being far from its expectation now goes down exponentially um, in terms of um, that distance uh, from the expectation. So how can we use that? What we're going to do is, is use it in the context of this median trick. What we're going to do is um, take a bunch of repetitions of that process that's giving us our estimator and take the median of those. So you know, why is the median going to help us here? What, what sort of magic about the median? So the observation is the following, that what we're trying to do is sort of get a good estimator. And the reason that our estimate might be, might be bad is it might be too high meaning it might be sort of far away from what we're looking for, it might be too low. So if we take our independent repetitions of this estimator and sort them, 
then what that does is it puts the, the good estimates right there in the middle and says that if there are bad estimates, they're sort of at the top end or at the bottom end. So if I then take those, those elements and I take the median, those estimates and take the median of them, then um, the only way that I can get a bad estimate to be at the median is if there's a large number of bad estimates. So if, if at least half, the top half of the estimates are bad or the bottom half of the estimates are bad, that's the only way I can get the median to be bad. So what that means is if, I, if I'm taking D estimations, then at least half of them must be bad to force the median to be bad. But what we said here is that each estimate is basically good with probability at least three quarters. So we only expect a quarter of them to be bad. We'd have to have uh, twice the expected number being bad to sort of force this overall bad event. So that's exactly the situation where you can plug in the Chernoff bound and you can say, well, what's the probability uh, when, your, when your individual probability is a quarter of seeing more than half of the um, overall number of estimates being bad? That then gets exponentially small in the number of estimates. So now taking just logarithmic in 1 over delta number of estimates gives you that small delta probability of failure. Okay. So, so why, why go through in that level of detail? Just because this outline, this overall outline, is one that's been used time and time again in constructing these kind of uh, compact um, summary approaches. Right? You build an estimator. You argue that estimator is, is, uh, has bounded variance, so it's, it's close to its expectation with constant probability. And then you take repetitions and use a structure like the median to drive that constant probability uh, of failure down to exponentially small probability of failure. Question? Why do you need dependence in the J functions? So let's say I, I take row 1, so I have J1 mm -hmm. of 1, 2, etc. Yeah. Why can't I just take everything to be independent? Uh, take what to be independent exactly? So at some point you say that you need something to be full wise. Yes. So yeah, so I, I need I need to think of these these hash functions, these hash values here, as behaving independently when I t look at any four of them. Oh, it's because you want to minimize the amount of randomness. We want to minimize the amount of randomness. Okay. So so you know the if these are you know functions. So if I really materialize these as truly independent random random variables, then to actually store them, I uh, to actually be able to make use of them, I need to store those coin tosses. So it sort of gets back to what I was saying at the start about randomness being a limited resource. Yeah. So now, how do you build the for, like, how much randomness do you need to build the four wise? Um, yeah. So I think I had this flushed up in the slides earlier, but let me write out a uh, four wise uh, random. Uh, um, so this is a family of, of four wise uh, random hash functions. Um, so um, g of x is going to be uh, alpha x cubed plus beta x squared plus gamma x plus uh, delta t. Uh, so here I'm doing my calculations in, in the uh, prime field P. Um, and what I need to, so if I pick alpha, beta, gamma, delta randomly from essentially uh, uh, each pick one independently from P, then over those random choices, um, I'm going to have what I need for for this random for this uh, hash function g. So you know why is why is that good? Because all I need to do is all I need to now do is store alpha, beta, gamma, and delta choices to get my hash function, rather than having to store something store true randomness for each place where I evaluate g. That's the game that we're playing, right? We're trying to switch from explicitly keeping randomness to saying, can I just switch to this hash function, which is described by a very small amount of uh, random parameters. Uh, 
evaluate to minus one one. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so that's true. So mod 2 and then 1 maps to plus 1, 0 maps to minus 1. It's basically a counting argument. Um, you just look at what's the probability of uh, collisions under this, and uh, it's, it's sort of a, a, f a fairly straightforward exercise in combinatorics. Okay. Yeah. So what does this give us? It gives us um, the ability to, to deal with um, F2, some of the squares. Uh, once you have F2 um, with relative error epsilon um, times the, the L2 norm, um, then sort of switching from F2 notation to um, vector notation, what this says is that um, I can also start estimating things like inner product between two vectors just by using the fact that I can, I can write um, in a product in terms of um, squared norms of x, y, and x plus y. Uh, and just with a bit of rearranging an argument, then uh, I get that guarantee. So another consequence of that is if I take this result and say, well, let, let my second vector y just be um, an indicator vector that's 1 at location j and 0 everywhere else, then that inner product pulls out the jth entry of x uh, and gives me error proportional to epsilon times L2 norm of x. So this, this we call like an L2 guarantee. This gives a sort of a, a count, uh, an L2 guarantee and this sort of approach is often called the count sketch approach compared to, we saw a similar result earlier where we got this in terms of epsilon times the one norm of the vector um, through the count min sketch um, with that L1 guarantee. So, I, I said earlier, this, this is a f essentially a form of dimensionality reduction. Um, so you can think of this sketching technique as basically being a low independence realization of the johnson linder strauss lemma. Um, and in fact, if you look at the current sort of best, sparsest constructions for johnson linder strauss they have more or less the same structure. Um, that is, they, they're based on this sparse hashing to uh, entries of a vector with plus one, minus one values. Um, so how do these two approaches compare? I mean, in some way you can say that they're more or less the same thing. You know, where do they differ? So in some ways, Johnson and Strauss is a little bit stronger because, you know, as, as Alex was saying, it embeds you directly into Euclidean space uh, rather than uh, embedding into, in, in, you know, rather than having this median operator on the outside that this approach has. But also, it's, it's in some sense weaker because um, you know, there's lower bounds that say if you want to do this kind of sparse Johnson and Strauss construction, then if you think about trying to, you know, what, what's the sparsity of that transform? Sparsity of that transform has to be at least uh, 1 over epsilon wise. In other words, each entry in the vector has to go to at least 1 over epsilon different locations to get the, the JL guarantee. Uh, and you need a stronger amount of independence of the hash functions. Whereas here, actually, it's, it's very, very sparse. Right? Each entry uh, in the vector is mapped to only log 1 over delta locations in the sketch. So you know, there's a potential to um, incorporate that into some very, very fast uh, code because you know, each index in the sketch is mapped only to a very small number of locations. OK. So I'm going to talk now for a while about a slightly different problem, um, relating again to vectors and relating to frequency moments of vectors. So now I'm going to talk about this idea of F0. F0 we can think of as being the number of distinct items in the stream, or number of entries in the vector that we're summarizing that have uh, a non-zero frequency associated with them. Um, the first uh, algorithms for this problem were, were designed around the 80s, early 80s, and analyzed in the assumption of 
fully independent hash functions. So I'm, I'm going to describe a sort of some what you can think of as a slight generalization of that algorithm, which we'll call the k-minimum values algorithm, um, which again uses only very weak hash functions. So so yeah. yeah. Good Turing is not an estimator for zero. No. So we're in a different regime here. What we're trying to do is, is give a very strong guarantee. We're trying to estimate um, number of distinct items um, up to epsilon relative error. Uh, and the difference is we're not in a sampling regime. Uh, in print, effectively, we do get to see everything, but we just can't remember everything. So you know, good Turing is much more about sort of a statistical approach to this. Here we're in this world where the data is the data. There is a certain number of distinct elements within this particular data set. Um, we get to see everything, but we can't remember everything. So what's, what's an estimator we can build that's going to nevertheless let us estimate the number of distinct things relative to that fixed true answer? So here's, here's the approach we're going to use. Um, again, let's, now let's think of the domain of the stream elements, uh, so that uh, the name of the input elements, so that each element of the data is somewhere in the range 1 up to m. Uh, and we're going to again use hash functions that map us into um, map us from items in the original space into actually much larger space. The reason we're picking this much larger space for the hashing is just so that we can sort of argue that um, effectively in this setting we can ignore the possibility of hash collisions under this hash function. Right? There's a tiny probability proportional to at most one on m um, that we have a collision. So we're just going to sort of condition on that event not happening and incur a very small penalty in our overall success probability. So here's, here's our procedure. Um, for each element in the input that arrives, we're going to compute the hash function um, under this particular hash function of that element. And we're going to track, um, in this case, the, the t distinct items that achieve the smallest values of this hash function. So, you know, why, why might this work? What, what is this relying on? What it's relying on critically is if we see the same value of i many times, then we, because these hash functions are fixed, now we get the same hash value of that. So the decision that we make is effectively going to be the same. And that's why as soon as we have this property, as soon as we use the hash function this way, we can sort of stop worrying about the multiplicity of individual items and just worry about how many distinct items there are. And what we're going to use to help build our estimator is, is this value vt, which is the, the, the value of the teeth, the hash of the teeth smallest distinct value that we see. So let, let me make that concrete, right? We see items uh, arriving. Uh, and here, if I set t equals 2, I keep track of those two items with the smallest hash values and the corresponding hash value of the teeth smallest of those. New item comes along, and I update my information. So I only need to remember information about these. I can forget whatever I saw about that. New items come along. That doesn't change my estimator in any way. A repetition, you know, I see another copy of this same item here. doesn't change anything because it, it sort of has the same hash value. I recognize it as being identical. Something else new comes along, and again I update. So yes. Uh, yeah. So in, in pretty much all of the, the things I'm talking about here, we're taking advantage. We're, we're working in a computational model where we're assuming we're going to look at every data item, and we're going to do something sort of rough. Uh, typically, we'll, we'll treat as being linear in the size of the input. So this is not sublinear. So you know, you, it depends what you're measuring. Um, so it's, it's linear in the size of the input in terms of the time that you take. But in terms of the size of the summary that you build, that we're going to treat as being sublinear. So, so you're going to be processing every single item. Going to process every single item. So uh, total running time is linear. But in terms of the quantities like the space, that we're going to treat as sublinear. So you're right that there are other models where people say, let's, let's be even more strictly sublinear. So let's you know, look at where we can only, say, sample into the data. Uh, and what you can argue is for a problem like this, 
anything which is based on sampling is basically going to fail. And the reason for that is just that you can show that unless you're sampling a very large fraction of the input elements, then you can't distinguish the case where um, the, the number of distinct elements is very small versus the case where the number of distinct elements is, very, is twice as big, say. But when you're sampling, then mm -hmm. you're having a, going back to that question, yeah. then there'll be a closer connection to the good Turing mm -hmm. line of work, right? Yeah. But there it works in some cases. So what's the difference between these two models? So in some sense, the, the difference here is that this is a model that gives the computational entity more power. It's saying if we can look at all the elements, then we, we can learn more information. Can we use that to get a better estimator? So what we're going to do is we're going to try and quantify this estimator in terms of how accurate it is as a function of this parameter t, because t is characterizing um, the size of this, the summary, the size of the information that's being kept. So, so you're right, you know, there's a whole line of, of other work that I'm not really talking about that looks at sampling estimators, that looks at sort of scaling computations based on, on that kind of sublinear approach. Um, so you know, that's, that's definitely you know, a whole other line of work that I, I don't really have time to get into, but it's another approach to this sort of scaling up to, to large computations like this. Okay. So you know, how or, or why should this work? Well, the idea is that, again, if, if this hash function that we're using is reasonably uniform, then if we look at, at where the teeth smallest hash value should be, that should, should roughly be sort of a, a uniform fraction, uh, a, a t over f0 fraction along this line, right? So here we're mapping items along this range. So this, this fraction should, if we scale it up, should tell us how many distinct items there are. So that's pretty much how we build our estimator. Um, what we do is, is we take um, t over vt and use that to scale this range m cubed. Right, so we look at sort of m cubed over vt is what fraction along this range we are, uh, and we scale that up by t. How do we analyze this? What we basically do is, is we look at, well, how can things go wrong? So let's hope for the best and plan for the worst. So what's one way it could go wrong? One way it could go wrong is based on the true value of F0. What can happen in terms of this estimator? What can happen is you know, we might be too high. You know, we want to be at most 1 plus epsilon times F0. So if this estimate is above F0, what does that really mean? It means that we sort of, relative to, to this boundary point where we should have been, we saw too many things. We should have seen about t things under here. But we saw a lot more than we expected under this threshold value. So what that means is we can say, you know, um, the number of items that we saw that hashed below that fixed threshold was more than t. So that, f that led to us having a bad estimate. That we can just do some rearrangement and look at what's the probability of for any individual item hashing outside of that range. Um, and if we then use that to sort of look at how many items do we expect, um, we can argue that the expected number of items hashing in this range looks small, right? So we're saying we got more than t. Actually, we expect roughly 1 minus epsilon times t items to fall in that range. So we can, again, follow the outline that I talked about already, look, look at the variance of this estimator, uh, variance of this quantity, and show that, similarly, the variance of this quantity is not too high. And here, again, we're, we're relying on independence in a particular way. We're relying on the fact that we can look at the, um, the variance of this random variable, which is basically the summation of a whole bunch of random variables talking about individual events. We can sum those up because, uh, be basically because each event is pairwise independent, and that's all we need to be able to sum those variances. <laughs>
So again, we just sort of plug in Chebyshev inequality, and what we get is the probability that we saw too many things hashing below that threshold. Um, we can express in terms of the variance, which we can then express in terms of t and epsilon. So what do we do? We just choose t to be large enough. In this case, t looks again proportional to 1 over epsilon squared to make that probability of this bad event being at most a constant. Right, so what we do is we work through just what's the, the probability that we see too many things hashing into too small a range, argue that this shouldn't be too likely based on a function of t, and choose t to make the probability of this bad event at most a constant. So what this gives us is that the probability that we see that our estimate is too large, we've now argued is at most a fifth. And then using essentially the same argument, just sort of changing... Uh, changing the terms around, you can similarly say that the probability that our estimate is too small, that we didn't see enough items hashing below a different threshold, um, is also at most a fifth. Um, so, apart from those two bad events, then we've got a good probability, at least a half, at least three fifths, that our estimate is not too small and is not too large. So again, we're in this situation where we have an estimator which a single instance of that estimator we believe is going to be good at least a constant fraction of the time. So again, we're going to amplify that probability um, so that the probability of failure is very small by repeating it log 1 over delta times in parallel. with different, uh, And those repetitions are based on drawing different draws from that family of hash functions. And again, we just plug in that same analysis that I talked about before, where we take those estimates and we take the median of those to, to push down that probability. So in terms of those costs I talked about at the start, um, what are we incurring? We're, we're choosing, we just have to store those hash values T. So that gives us a dependency on 1 over epsilon squared log M, much stronger than, than we'd get from uh, something like good Turing, um, to give this relative error guarantee. And actually, you know, subsequent work has, has even sort of said, well, let's turn this multiplicative log factor into an additive log factor by more hashing tricks uh, and more sort of representation tricks. And in terms of processing each update to this summary structure, what do I have to do? I just have to do this hashing. I have to do this comparison with the, teeth, the current teeth smallest hash value and update uh, if something's not or already present. So this, again, we can do very quickly indeed. Uh, effectively, constant time per update. Um, so just one thing to sort of mention briefly, which is that, um, so I said at the start, well, typically we're not going to care too much about constants. This, this notion of, of counting, this notion of counting the number of distinct events, turns out to be a fairly fundamental kind of computation in a lot of big data applications. So there has been a lot of int interest for this kind of uh, algorithm in really engineering it as much as possible uh, and really actually hammering down on those constants. So you know, the current state of the art is something a little bit different to what I showed you. It's something called the hyperlog log algorithm. I won't really describe the details, um, but you know, it's, it's something where people have really focused on saying exactly how many bits do we need in our hash function, how do we represent this compactly, what kind of tricks can we do to really squeeze down that leading constant. So for this, um, for this algorithm, we're still using sort of 1 over epsilon squared space, um, but that log factor gets crushed down to a log log factor, which in turn gets treated as a constant when people actually go off and implement this. And it, it has that, uh, some additional flexibility, because you can reason not just about the number of distinct elements that you've seen summarized by one sketch structure, but you can start looking at not just unions between different sketches, but also intersections. So um, in particular, what you can do is, is, as I said before, sort of by analogy to what I was saying about um, F2 estimation, um, you can similarly use uh, identities like the fact that the size of the intersection between two sets can be expressed as uh, the sum of the size of the two sets less the size of the union. And so you can take your sketch for set A, your sketch for set B, 
merge them together to get a sketch for A union B, and plug in the estimates for each of these. Now, in both cases, and in this case, you have to exercise a little bit of caution because the error that you obtain, you shouldn't expect to be able to estimate this quantity very strongly. It turns out that estimating the size of an intersection is going to be one of the fundamentally hard problems that, that we obtain. So we don't, we're not going to expect relative error here, but instead we're going to expect error that scales, in this case, uh, proportional to the square root of the product of the size of these two sets. Um, so this error term is going to sort of mask out the true answer for very small intersections, but for decent sized intersections, this kind of thing is nevertheless going to work quite well. And, and one can take this approach and generalize it to sort of higher order intersections via inclusion exclusion. Um, I'm not going to talk in, in any depth about bloom filters. I just wanted to mention bloom filter because, again, um, in terms of how people are using these kind of algorithms in practice, then I think bloom filter is an example of a sketch that is very widely used um, in a number of applications. So what, what does bloom filter do? It basically compactly encodes set membership. Um, so it's an interesting kind of sketch because um, it's only very lightly sublinear in terms of its space, right? What bloom filter allows us is to uh, represent um, a set of um, n elements in space that's proportional to n bits. Um, but what it gives us is just that, that saving going from potentially large exact representations of elements down to this sort of compact bit array representation in terms of bits is enough of a saving that this alone is sort of at the heart of, of many of the, the sort of big data applications um, people are looking at these days. And, and for some reason, it seems to have generated a highly active research area, particularly within, say, the networking community. So uh, pretty much every networking conference these days seems to have several papers on innumerable variations of bloom filter as a way of, of representing set information. So I have a, a few minutes left, uh, and then I think we should probably wrap it up for the day. So I just wanted to talk briefly about a few other directions where people have been looking at um, sketching streaming computations over large vectors. So we talked about frequency moments um, being that the sum of the kth power of the frequencies um, and we looked at F0 counting the number of distinct elements, we looked at F2 counting the sum of the squares of the element frequencies. So the last, you know, the, the, the next thing to look at is to say, well, what about k greater than 2? Um, so I, I won't talk about this algorithm in any depth. Um, there's an algorithm going back to the, the Alonitel paper from 96 that comes up with a nice estimator for this um, based on um, the, sort of the streaming view of the world where you get to see each update, based on building a nice estimator for this and arguing it has exactly the right expectation. Uh, and bounded variance, um, which gives not the best bounds for this and, and something which doesn't quite meet our definition of a sketch because um, it doesn't have this uh, linearity property. So w what I'll do instead is, is in the next uh, talk tomorrow morning, talk in a little bit more detail about a different approach to estimating high frequency moments which has those um, linear sketch properties. Um, Alex, in, in his uh, presentation on embeddings, talked about uh, essentially combinations of frequency moments. Right? He talked about a particular combination where you look at the sum of the squares of values of, of L infinity applied to L1 norm. So more generally, you can start thinking about other ways of combining norms. Right? Instead of just wanting a um, number of distinct items, you could look at something based on, say, the, the sum of the squares of number of distinct items, um, which you can think of as being, you know, you have your input now represented as a matrix, you want to count number of distinct items on each row, and then look at the squares of those counts. Um, and there have been a variety of techniques approach to that. The general idea there is to start looking at the existing sketch techniques that we have already, and start reasoning about how we can compose them, how you can sort of take an inner sketch, 
um, for the initial computation and then sort of wrap that into an outer level sketch for the next level computation. Um, as you can imagine, it's, it's not really that trivial to analyze these kind of things. Uh, the constants blow up, the size of the sketches blow up, uh, and you tend to need a new analysis every time you start doing these kind of more complex combinations of computations to uh, get the overall guarantee. Uh, another approach, another set of problems that people have looked at quite a lot is questions about range efficiency. So I've talked about the input model where each update in the input gives you some information about some new arrival individually. But sometimes I want to think about, we might want to think about the input specifying, say, ranges. So we think, you know, we think the input gives us sort of the range AB, meaning that we want to suddenly insert a copy of item you know, A, A plus 1, A plus 2, all the way up to B. So certainly you could just unpack that range and take time linear in the size of that range. Um, but what you'd really like to do is, is do things range efficiently. Um, so people have looked at things like range efficient F0 by saying, you know, when you take the aggregation of all these ranges, how much do you end up covering? Um, as a nice approach, which essentially uses a sketch very much like the, the Cayman and value sketch, but just sort of unpacks those hash computations and looks at exactly what's the impact on the hash functions as these indices increment and sort of m very efficiently computes um, the impact on those hash functions, pulls out which are the subset of these items that hash into that range uh, of the prefix um, of the hash range. Um, people have also looked at that for range efficient F2. Um, and most recently, going from a range to a rectangle. So now you have uh, essentially two-dimensional ranges. And again, how do you very efficiently process the updates, uh, again, by unpacking the structure of those hash functions? OK, so I think that's probably a good time to start wrapping things up now um, for today. Uh, so I wanted just to, at the end, put up a couple of trailers for uh, forthcoming attractions. Um, so firstly, um, Andrew McGregor, um, sitting at the back wearing a very similar looking shirt, is going to be giving a, a mini 10 lecture course on streaming, data stream, and data stream computations, um, starting, I think, in early October. And secondly, this idea of, of succinct data representations via sketches is something that's going to get covered in much more depth in a workshop, um, not next week, but the following week uh, in this very room. So I'd certainly encourage you, those of you that are sticking around uh, over this semester, to um, interact and participate in both of those. Um, and tomorrow, um, we'll pick up again um, on this topic of uh, uh, advanced topics looking at things based around sampling, some matrix computations, and some lower bounds results. Okay. So that's probably the right time to stop. Um, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any further questions? Okay. Good. So I think we pick up again tomorrow morning bright and early. <laughs>